Now, as we've told you before, there are electrons in each of the two metallic layers which are free to move around. These electrons occupy a certain set of closely spaced energy levels. If the temperature is close to the absolute zero, then, to a first approximation, these levels are occupied only up to a certain maximum energy level called the Fermi energy. The Fermi energy is not, in general, the same in different metals, considered separately. But in the junction we have here, the metals are in contact through the oxide layer via the tunneling process. Tunneling does take place, and so a net number of electrons moves from one side to the other until the highest occupied levels equalize. At this point, no further net exchange of tunneling electrons will occur. A consequence of this transfer of electrons is to raise the electrical potential of one metal layer and lower that of the other. The difference in potential is called the contact potential. Next, let us suppose that we apply a slowly increasing voltage across the junction from the outside with the help of a battery. This is exactly what we did in our last experiment. It further raises the energy of each electron on one side while lowering the energy of the electrons on the other. Now we can see why, in our last experiment, a current flowed through the oxide layer when a voltage was applied across the junction. Tunneling occurs and continues as long as the voltage is applied. Electrons tunnel and occupy empty, excited levels on the other side. The external battery removes them again and others tunnel into their places, and so on. We now repeat the tunneling experiment. But this time, we will do it at one and a half degrees Kelvin with a junction submerged in liquid helium. At one and a half degrees, the lead film is superconducting. The aluminum film, however, remains a normal conductor at this temperature. As a matter of fact, we are using it here only as an ordinary conductor. Aluminum was chosen because it is easy to evaporate it from a hot wire in vacuo and because it forms a strong and thin aluminum oxide layer when restored to air. Again, we apply a slowly increasing voltage to the junction, which is now at 1.5 degrees. Notice that now hardly any electrons tunnel through the junction until, at about one and a quarter millivolts, a sharp rise of current occurs. Are we to believe that the oxide layer becomes a perfect dielectric allowing no tunneling when it was cooled from above 7 to 1.5 degrees Kelvin, and that it broke down when the condenser was charged to a value of about one and a quarter millivolts? The answer is, of course, no. One can show, in fact, that the properties of the oxide were not appreciably altered by this cooling, whereas we do know that the lead film changed from a normal to a superconductor. As we've shown earlier, this is the condition of the energy levels on either side of the junction when the lead is normally conducting. However, when the lead turns superconducting and an increasing external voltage is applied, there is no tunneling until this voltage reaches about one and a quarter millivolts. Hence we conclude in the lead layer, there are no energy levels available at first. That some energy levels are forbidden to the electrons in the lead after it makes its transition to the superconducting state. To put it in another way, there is a gap in the electron energy levels for superconducting lead. When we apply an increasing external voltage now, there will be, at first, no possibility for tunneling until the voltage is large enough to bring occupied levels opposite unoccupied levels. Then tunneling current flows and will continue to do so as long as we apply this external voltage of sufficient size. As we have seen in our experiment, the minimum required voltage is of the order of millivolts. Such energy gaps have also been found in most of the other superconductors. In all cases, they are small and of the order of milli-electron volts. In the normally conducting state of a metal, 
the conduction electrons behave like free particles. That means they behave as if they were free from each other. The strong Coulomb repulsion between any two of them is screened out by the aggregate of all the other electrons. Behavior like free particles also means that the electrons are not bound by the positive ions of the metal's crystal lattice. 